For those of you I have not had the pleasure of meeting, my name is Amy Doviditis, and I am a librarian at UCF's Curriculum Materials Center. Now, the Curriculum Materials Center is a library. Yes, there are two libraries on UCF's campus, and we are housed in the education complex over near Garage A&I. And in the Curriculum Materials Center, we are our collection, what books and things that you find on our shelves really makes us look like a library that you would see in a kindergarten through 12th grade school because the, the, the collections or the curriculums we serve are the School of Teacher Education. So the, all of the students that want to be teachers, the faculty, when they're looking for resources to complete their lessons, they come to our library. But of course, our library is open to everybody and um, come over and check us out. We have a lot of lot young adult literature, popular videos, great place to study. So we hope to see you in the Curriculum Materials Center. And as far as today, we're going to be talking about uh, for Diversity Week, <clears throat> excuse me, the Diverse Family Bookshelf. Megan, um, Hot is with me from the UCF library as my co-sponsor here in the background. So she's gonna help me monitor the chat and whatnot. <clears throat> so when it comes to children's picture books, I love this quote and it says, children's picture books are some of the earliest forms of media that teach children about diversity in the world. Social, social messages that young children glean from picture books will likely stay with them for the rest of their lives. All right. So we're gonna give a, a little Padlet a try. <clears throat> and <clears throat> Megan is going to go ahead and actually it is posted in your chat right now. Up at the top of the chat in the very beginning, there's a little bit.ly code. So there's two ways that you can enter into this Padlet with me. And we're going to, you know, everybody share, what was the title of your favorite childhood book? And the two ways you can get into this Padlet are you can scan the QR code on your phone or of course you can click on the link in the chat and both will take you out. So I'm going to join you all in that bit.ly or in that Padlet. And this is what it looks like. So in, if, um, if you're in the Padlet right now, down in the bottom right hand corner here, if you click on that plus, you get a board to post on. And if you would, for me, tell me what the title of your, <clears throat> oh, do we have two open here? Oh, there are, okay, forgive me for one second, guys. I'm gonna close one of these, all right. So you can click on the plus in the bottom and add your own board. Let me make sure I don't have two open now. Yep, there we go. And go ahead and type in the title of your favorite book. And if you really want to add a little bit more to it, you can actually go out to Google and find a picture of the cover and add it in. Now I see that the Padlet is updating elsewhere somewhere else, and I'm a little confused by that. Here, let's see here. There we go. Okay, so we have Where the Wild Things Are, Pat the Bunny. Oh, that was a personal favorite for many of my kids. If anybody else wants to share. We have uh, Where the Wild Things Are, another one, Where the Wild Things Are. I agree with that one. And what I love about this Padlet is you can, um, you can favorite things, I can add comments. A little bit interactive Padlet, um, Where the Mountain, I'm waiting for that one, Where the Mountain Meets the Moon. I'm trying to think what the completion of that title is. Now for me, now I, I'm expecting I'm probably older than many of you in the audience right now. I am, uh, let's see, how old am I gonna be? 55. And for me, my favorite book when I was little was Busy Town. I loved all the Richard Scarry books. I thought they were, I just loved to imagine myself immersed in that, in that whole scene. And I'm just going down and checking the chat here, okay. Fox and Socks, Dr. Seuss, Where the Mountain Meets the Moon. Awesome book. I agree 100% on that one. Um, Fox and Socks. Funny thing about Dr. Seuss, as a child, I was not a fan. I, I did not get the nonsensical rhyming thing as a kid. As an adult, I absolutely adore it. So my, my palate definitely changed as far as what I liked as a kid and what I liked as an adult. All right, so we get a good snippet there of some of our favorite picture books as as when we're children, I'm gonna pop back into our PowerPoint. 
So let me ask you, when you think about that favorite picture book, I want you to think about who was the main character. And if that main character was a person, now Fox and Sox, this option won't be for you. And Richard Scarry, it won't be for me either because they were little creatures, personified animals. Did the person, the main character look like you? And I'm curious um, if that applies for any of you as far as what was your favorite book. Sometimes who the main character does not reflect back as far as what you look like or who you are. Um, especially as children, a lot of times our favorite books have personified animals. So for any of you that answered that question, when you think about your favorite book, was the main character a person? And did it in any way reflect back at you and how you looked? And I think from a lot of those um, titles that were listed in there, um, like Where the Wild Things Are, not sure, you know, and there's a lot of monsters and little boy in there, but um, so we might not, a lot of those questions might not be applicable necessarily for picture books. But I do want to share with you, and I shared with you my age, you know, giving you some nice good information there. Let's take a look and peek at the childhood books for me. And I found this really cool Pinterest page. I'm going to eek back out here again if it lets me go. There we go. Forgive me, I'm going to be popping all around today. So I went back and looked, and this person did a great job of listing childhood books from the 60s and 70s, which I am a child of. And as I look down at all these covers, these are covers I remember. These are books I remember. These are things I saw. These are those first images, like that quote from the very beginning of the PowerPoint. These are the images that were impressed upon me as a child. So I wanted to scroll down. And as I'm scrolling down, I want you to take careful note of the image on the cover. I want you to take careful note of who was that main character and just Remembering this is the 60s and 70s. I was born in 1966. And I want you to note all the white people you see. Here is an exception, Little Black Sambo, which um, now would be considered a stereotypical biased book. Keep looking down, lots of white people. Looks like me, I had blonde hair, lots of personified characters. Once again, lots of Disney, lots of white people, lots of personified characters. All of these books, a lot of these books, golden books were very big in my day. Look at that manners. So for me as a child growing up in the 50s, huff and puff stuff, for those of you who remember that, for me as growing up as a child in the 60s and 70s, this was very reflective of who I was. I didn't see anything that was amiss. Now we do have, and somewhere up there was a snowy day. I know snowy days in here somewhere. There is very little reflective back of anyone with a diverse background as far as ethnicity or culture or color. Ezra Jack Keats was well beyond the time as far as representing someone of a different color. This book here now, The Five Chinese Brothers, is considered a stereotype book and actually is frowned upon for what, how um, the Chinese culture is, is partaked and shown. But this is my pad of what I had to reflect back to me at my age. Okay, I'm gonna go back to our PowerPoint. Now, so I, I was curious, what are some of the outlets now? If a parent were to go and look, what would they see? So this is a, a recent list from Time Magazine. Time Magazine's the 100 best children's book of all time. Now, Time Magazine is a, a name that we as people have come to know and trust. So let's take a look. I'm just going to pop through. I'm not going to pop through all 100. All right, Snowy Day was number two. Love that. Good Night Moon, one of my children's favorites. Once again, keeping your eyes on the characters, the main characters and who they are and what you see reflected back. This is Time Magazine telling parents, this is the 100 best books to go and get and read for your kids. There is something missing here. 
and it's standing out like a sore thumb for me now as a librarian with my eye to look for it. But I can tell you right now, as a parent raising my children without the eye to look for it, I did not see it missing. And I'm going to go back for a moment, if it will let me go back. Uh, well, let me go back. Okay, there was one book that had someone of color on the page, and it was a historical um, biography. There is a lot, there is no representation. And once again, the book of someone of color was a biography. So sad statement. Now let's go look at NPRs. NPR, there we go, there we go. NPR got it right. Crown, look at what's reflected back. Julian is a Mermaid is a wonderful picture book about a boy who wants to dress up as a, behave as, um, it's a gender book. And he, his gender is more leaning towards the female gender and he dresses up like a mermaid. Native American, Tar Beach, Undefeated has won tons of awards. Ezra Jack Heats, um, great representation going on. Harlem, Anti-Racist Baby. You can see here in NPR's representation of what's reflected back. We are finally seeing, um, this was a uh, Caldecott, a couple years ago. We are finally seeing, this is Hispanic, wonderful book, another call to cut. What, we are finally seeing representation reflected back. Time Magazine did a horrible, horrible job at it, but NPR, much better. So why is this all so important? What does it matter what I saw as a child? What does it matter what those lists say now? And a lot of that comes back um, and a lot of what I am studying now as a librarian comes back to the woman in the corner and her name is Dr. Rudine Sims Bishop. And she started this metaphor that picture books or books in general are meant to be mirrors, windows and sliding glass doors. Mirrors because when a child experiences a book, they should see themselves reflected back. Window because they should be able to glance through that window and see another, an, some other culture experience something else and a sliding glass door so they can step through and experience it in someone's shoes. And I love what I've highlighted here because it says when children cannot find themselves reflected in the books they read or when the images they see are distorted, negative, negative or laughable, they learn a powerful lesson about how they are devalued in the society of which they are a part. So when I was young growing up and I saw that long list of books and they all look like me, I had no idea. I saw nothing wrong. I saw myself reflected back over and over and over again. I did not know that something was missing. This picture is worth a thousand words to me. This was put out um, about a year ago. Um, and the power of a mirror in literature. This boy saw himself reflected back in the book Crown. And you can see all of the awards that book has, has won. And the book is about um, a boy that goes to get his haircut in a, in a black barber shop. And it's, it's a fabulous book. And the power of being able to see himself reflected authentically back in a book that he gets to see himself as a character in that book. There is a lot of power of the image and the positive image that that portrays. I just want to say if you have any questions or you want to stop along, Megan's helping me monitor the chat. So feel free to pop anything into the chat as we go along. When I started working at UCF, um, I took a diversity training. And this is, or at that point was the definition for diversity through UCF. Diversity encompasses those human characteristics that make us unique, as well as the many universal qualities that make us the same. I like that definition. And one of the other things it introduced me to was the sense of diversity being this huge wheel. There's so many more things that are represented on that wheel. It's just not gender, race, culture, ethnicity. There's so much more. What is your level of income? What is my age? It's my appearance. It's where I work. There's so much more to that term diversity than a lot of people, um, than a lot of people see. All right, so we're going to try another Padlet together, and Megan is going to go, oops, I'm sorry, I went ahead there.
Megan is going to go ahead and pop that in the text box for me, that Padlet link that you can go ahead and click on it. Or once again, you can just go ahead and um, click on the image of that QR code. So the question I have for you is that, let's say you're looking for a diverse book. Either it has a diverse theme of some form or um, a diverse character. How would you go about finding that in our, our library catalog? What would you actually type in to do that search? So let's go out and we're gonna go to our Padlet. <clears throat> All right, so go ahead, if you can click on that and join me in the Padlet. <clears throat> and let's see what we can get. So if I were to click here, what would I type here if I was looking for a diverse book? I could tell you right now the word diverse fails horribly. Ethnicity, that would be successful to a certain extent. Young adult, black main characters, okay. What else do you think? <clears throat> and sometimes getting too specific narrows it down too much. Uh, LGBTQ, yes. Okay, just give another moment if anybody wants to pop anything in. Finding these books that represent either a diverse theme or a diverse character, I can tell you right now, especially for us at in an academic institution when we're searching for K through 12 books because we're looking for books that are K through 12 themed in an academic catalog, this can be very difficult. All right, so thank you to those that um, share, shared. I'm gonna go ahead and pop over here now. This is just a tiny list, and I see tiny, of the different subject headings that will get you to some form of a book that is related to an element of diversity. And I mean, this is just a tiny option. And very often, because of the verbiage that we use, you and I use when we talk, is different from the verbiage that catalogers use when they classify a book. It can be very difficult to find these diversity gems sitting on our shelves in libraries. Um, unless you know those specific terms, we have to use the nomenclature, the words we're familiar with when we type it into those search parameters and we hope that we hit something, but sometimes it doesn't work but yet we know there is ideal books sitting for us on those library shelves, but we're not finding them because they're hard to find because we're not able to match up in our head how we're searching with how that book has been cataloged. So very often these treasures, these diverse books are sitting on our shelves unfound because, I mean, look at how many books are in the main library. In our CMC, we have 30,000 books. So unless I as a librarian, I'd love to be able to remember all those, have a specific book in mind, I have to be able to rely on that catalog to help me find those books. And even for me as a librarian, matching what I have in my head with how books are classified in a catalog, sometimes those things don't match up and that makes it hard to find. So why does this matter? Why does, of course, we talked about the mirror reflecting back. Let's, let's even look at what's out there for children's books right now. Every three years, the Cooperative Children's Book Center gives out this statistic. And it's a wonderful statistic because they look at um, picture books that they've brought into their collection. This is through the University of Wisconsin-Madison. And they evaluate these picture books from main character. This was um, the most recent one was in 2018. And if you look down at the bottom of the slide, you can see that um, there are 2015 statistics, 2012. Now let's go up to the top one for 2018 at the very top in black. And as you see, all of those children are looking at themselves in mirrors. Because remember, we, I was talking about how picture books, that mirror metaphor, that a child should be able to see themselves reflected back in a book, the main character. And if we look all the way to the right, the white boy has the most representation in picture books. So in 2018, the Cooperative Children's Book Center, they read and evaluated over 3,000 books. And 50% of those, a little over 1,500, 
had a white boy as a main character. That's why he's got the most mirrors. He's looking like in a kaleidoscope, almost like a fun house. He sees himself as an astronaut, as a king, as just a regular boy. He sees himself everywhere. The next group of picture books, the main characters, they were animals or something else, you know, personified creatures and animals, personified spoons for that, you know, it could be anything. 27%, so 864 books. But as we get further to the left and we start to get into the different ethnicities, we see a stark drastic con um, contrast as far as representation goes. And as the representation gets smaller, their mirrors get smaller. So the validity of seeing who they are in those picture books reflected back and represented in the picture books gets smaller and smaller and smaller until you get to the American Indian First Nations. If you look at the numbers between 2012 and the yellowish orange up to 2018, we do see there is an increase. We do see change. A lot of this has been um, accomplished by first parents and publisher, parents and um, teachers and educators pushing. And there was some holdback on publishers finally accepting this. And a lot of publishers have finally embraced it. So we've seen more out there being published, but you can see that there is a, a long way to go. So now we're getting to the diverse family bookshelf. And in this case, necessity is a mother of invention. And the, in that picture on the left is Christine Schrager. She is a librarian here at UCF and um, one of the creators, the original creators of the Diverse Families Bookshelf. And with her in that picture is her daughter, Nuri. Nuri was um, an adopted child. And um, when Christine brought Nuri home, she, being a librarian, of course, looked to find books that mirrored and reflected her family. A single parent, two different races, and she wanted to read Nuri books that reflected who they were as a family unit. And Christine could not find those books. She could not, as a librarian, find those books available. She even went to bookstores trying to find the books, and they didn't have the books. So Christine, along with... Um, Yolanda Hood, who is my predecessor in my current position, they were the first to devise the Diverse Families database, which has now evolved into what we call the Diverse Families Bookshelf. It is a UCF grown database. It originated through the help of five grants, a fellowship, 25 student assistance, custom artwork and database support by um, staff here at the UCF libraries. Without them, this wouldn't be possible. And our website. And it is now evolved into what you see here, the Diverse Family Bookshelf. The Diverse Family Bookshelf was created because Christine and Yolanda, um, and I've been here for it'll be three years in January, we needed to give people a finding tool. We've recognized how difficult these very important books can be to find. So we have established this as a finding tool. So our mission is to identify these books, to connect children and teens with these literature and to reveal all of those different cultures and life experiences that people, that our readers and our children need to be exposed to. And of course, building empathy and social emotional learning aspects across along the way. All right, that is our, our graphic, which was done by our own um, Cynthia Dansel here at UCF Libraries. Every book in the Diverse Families Bookshelf is broken into one of four primary categories. It has to initially fit into one of these four. Family relationships, health and disability, LGBTQ, race and culture. When the Diverse Families database first started, it was mainly looking at um, biracial and LGBTQ. But as time progressed, we saw the need and the demand and the ability to create a bigger finding tool and to reach out to more people and children and parents and, and, and educators trying to connect these books with these with our readers. When you click into the diverse family bookshelf, um, this is a picture of our forward facing web page. So as you can see now, I'm clicked on family relationships. As you click on each of these tabs, the corresponding secondary categories um, will appear below. So these are the primary categories that they have to belong to, and these are the secondary categories. So under family relationships, adoption, divorce, 
parent right termination, incarceration, homelessness, these kinship care, these are the types of books that you will see. Thank you, Megan, for posting the, um, the website. These are the type of books that you will find in categories you will find in under family relationships. Now, before I came to UCF, I was actually a children's librarian in elementary school. I was a science teacher before that. But as a children's librarian and working in elementary school, and I've sat in a lot of um, class meetings, you know, the teachers sit down in the morning and the students come and they sit on the carpet and they share. And I can remember countless stories of children sitting down and talking about incarcerated parents. The level of kinship care in our schools is increasing that children are being raised by aunts, uncles, grandmothers, grandpas, other people other than their immediate family, their immediate parents. There are so many different ways that diversity is reflected back in our family unit and how it's represented now. And these books are difficult to find. For LGBTQ, sorry, I gotta move something here. Our, our secondary topics are down here, gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender, um, gender nonconformity, and so on. Health and disability is our newest category. That being the primary topic, our secondary topics are down here, physical disability, developmental learning, mental illness, physical appearance, and so on. And race and culture, we've broken it into um, not only ethnicities, but um, we've um, also now incorporated immigrant and refugees. Language barrier is a big part of it and race discrimination. This is what a typical page will look at, look like. Now, a few slides back, I talked about that um, there are 25 student workers. In order for a book to be entered into the diverse family bookshelf, the book is read in its entirety from the first page to the last page. Those readers get to know all the intimate nuances and all the pieces and parts of these characters and what are the true concepts of what that book is trying to reflect. Now, when a book is, is first published and it's sent off to be cataloged or presented to the Library of Congress, sometimes these um, the picture books don't even have their pictures when they're, when they're cataloged, which to me seems like a very impossible task because it's called a picture book and very often some of the most inherently important characteristics are what is embedded in that that picture and not in the words so when things are sent off to the library of congress and and you know librarians are trying to read thousands of books to try to get them cataloged to go into our our common catalog they're not seeing that full picture they're doing the best they can with the information they're given and in the time they have where with the Diverse Families Database, these books are, are read in their entirety so that the readers are able to pull out all the nuances, the important pieces that need to be searchable and found. So when you're looking at health and disability, that is um, in the red, that's the primary category. The physical disabilities in green are the secondary categories. And then in black, those are the tertiary categories. So all the readers, their eyes are looking for, they're thinking about these different pieces and parts that they can, can list this book. Because the more things you can find in it that are searchable, the more reflective back for whoever that and book is important for, whoever's searching for that one hidden gem to reflect back who they are and what's going on in their life. If we're able to reveal those elements and make that book findable, literally, through this finding tool through the Diverse Families Bookshelf. And that's just going through some of the other divisions that we have for family adoption, race and culture, and so on. Like I was saying, most of the reading in the Diverse Family Bookshelf is done by students. The book is read in its entirety. We are looking to see who the story is about. We're um, very careful as we're looking for, we're looking for identifying information about the characters and their families. We're paying attention to things of race and gender and circumstances of the family. And if it's a picture book, we tell our readers to take a picture walk first, because as we get older, we tend to let, let the words take over. And, but when young children are viewing a picture book, especially for the first time, it's not the words that are hitting them, it's the pictures, especially for the younger ones that aren't able to read those words. Their eyes have to take the picture walk. The eyes are what are do, uh, uh, the eyes are absorbing the story. They're not getting it through the words. So that's why I'm a little concerned about when we look at when books go off and be cataloged by the Library of Congress, they're not looking at the pictorial content. They're purely looking at 
the written content. So these readers are also looking to see what is the message, what is the important information that is being um, given off in the illustrations. All right, so let's go take a peek. We're going to pop out and see the Diverse Family Bookshelf. This is what our website looks like. This is our forward facing web page, much of what we've already um, looked at. And you can click on the different categories, the primary categories, and you'll get some books below. And I'm going to go into gender nonconformity. Okay. So these, all of these books have been read by our readers. Not all of these books do we have in our collection. Um, these are books that also are interlibrary loaned. They're not purely in, um, found in UCF's collection. So I'm just going to click on. Uh, uh, we'll click on a tale of two daddies. When a book is put in, this is all of the features that we're looking for. These top ones are very common to things that you would already find in our catalog. But here is where they start to get different because we're looking at the main character. We're looking to tell you, is it a female? Is it a child? Is it a young adult? Is it adult? So who that mirror, who is being reflected in that book? Who's the main character? For a lot of readers, if it's a girl or a boy, it's a child, it's a teenager, when they're picking books, that type of information is really important. We give race, race and ethnicity as um, accurately as we can. The family formation, and then the um, readers can also pop in keywords. And then there's something called diversity impact. It's either direct or indirect. So it's, it's direct if the content, the story is related to the topic. It's indirect if it's just something that's in the background. And in this case, the um, Tale of Two Dowdies is a direct contact book. And over here, you can search through the different um, finding tools on the left hand side. There are picture books, everything down from pre K up to young adult literature. Tons of books to go and look at. And I want to point you over to here because here is where this find in your library, it will let you know if we have it in our own library here at UCF. And then if we don't have it, it can direct you to other finding tools if you would like to purchase the book. Okay, I'm going to pop out and come back to this. When our readers are entering the books, we use something called Qualtrics. We try to keep it as standardized as possible so that the format and how things are evaluated are, are consistent. One of the things that you'll also see that our readers are finding is Lexile. And Lexile is a readability measure. So those are searchable parameters. Um, Lexile will, like a Lexile, if a book was at a Lexile of 200, that would be like an easy, um, Dr. Seuss book like uh, uh, Redfish, Bluefish, um, those types of books. Actually, Redfish, Bluefish is probably a BR beginning reader, all the way up to a Harry Potter, which is somewhere in the 800s, 900s. We pick our, we pick our uh, genre. Some of these aren't exactly what we would consider a genre, but they are categories that would help our, our, the public find particular areas of books. We're looking at grade level. Then they're picking the primary topic. So this is all formulaic. It takes them through the survey using Qualtrics. And it, if they click on things, it then progresses them through in a logical fashion, answering questions that are pertinent to that category, which they've picked. So because mental illness was picked, these are the ones they can choose from, but they always have other to choose from. There's no way for us to, to encapsulate all of mental illness into our database. So what we're doing is we're looking for trends of publishing. What are a lot of things being out there published on? And those will be the main ones, but there's always the ability for the reader to type in other, other excuse me, as far as a topic that was not covered. And if we see a lot of those coming in, we will add it as a secondary category. And then that's direct or indirect. Is the, is the book directly talking about that diversity topic or is it somewhere in the background in passing? And then it would be indirect. This is probably one of the most powerful pieces to me. It's so easy for us to go off into a catalog and find a book about a bear, a book about lions, a picture book that has talking trees. But yet when it comes to giving you main character information that has to do with people, that's not easy. Catalogs, typical public libraries, academic catalogs do not do that. 
So how do you find the true reflective mirror for that reader if we are not looking at people as main characters and trying to quantify or qualify who they are? So the readers go through that as well. And they're looking for the clues that will also give you um, race, race and ethnicity. So I'm gonna take you in a walk with me, in the book Walk With Me, and have you look at it um, as readers and have you look at it as um, what our readers would do when they take a book through the process to get into the Diverse Families bookshelf. But before we start that, I'm just gonna stop and say, do you have any questions so far before we jump into showing you how a book ends up into the Diverse Family bookshelf? Any questions? I'll just keep my eye on the chat. Um, Megan, if you saw anything come up, let me know. I'm looking there, I don't see anything. So I'll give it another second. And of course, hope we'll have question time at the end as well. All right. So I'm gonna take you into the book, Walk With Me, through a website that is um, EPIC, which is a free website to educators. And as UCF students, if you're a future educator, um, you can log in and get a free account. And I think I do have it up already. So I'm gonna pop out, yes, I do. All right, so I'm gonna just take us on a picture walk and read this book, Walk With Me. And I want you as evaluators to tell me how this book ended up in the diverse family bookshelf. Did it belong under family relationships? Did it belong under mental health and disability? What, what do you see? What was, why did this book end up in there? Okay, so here we go. Keep an eye on those pictures. Keep me company on the way home. Then I can have someone to talk to so I don't fall asleep. On the long walk out of the city. Let's go as fast as we can. Then wait for me. Let's go together into the neighborhood and to the store that won't give us credit anymore. Eat with us and if you like, you can wait till mama gets home from the factory. If you'd rather, you could go up into the hills again. but then come back when I call. Okay. So why do you think that book, I'm gonna close my PowerPoint, my apologies, hold on one second. Why do you think that book ended up in the Diverse Families bookshelf? So feel free to, um, what categories do you think that fell under? What did you see as far as the relationship? What was going on in that story? If you have anything you wanna add, you can just go ahead and type it into the chat. Single parent and poverty, 100% Zoe. Single parent and poverty, I agree. Those are two of the uh, family formation secondary categories. Good find Zoe. Latina, yes. Zaritza, you, you picked on one that a lot of people miss. If you were looking at the pictures, you noticed what, Zaritza, what did you notice that clued you into that? This is where taking a picture walk is really important. Um, she picked up on the signs, yeah. Um, the signs were almost all in Spanish. Okay, good job, guys. So when you look at that book, oops, excuse me, I'm popping ahead. When you look at that book um, in our catalog, this is how it was cataloged as, fatherless families imagination. So it did get the fatherless family, I, I, and I, I agree with that. So if you didn't quite catch it, the dad's picture was, um, as they were in bed, the picture next to it had the dad. Now we don't know what happened to the dad, if he's passed or he's not around for whatever reason. But that, it, it, Zoe and um, Zaritza, you got it just right. They're definitely, um, that's what we would look, look for. Okay. All right. 
So we're going to test your eyes again. I'm going to share with you a very recent book to our collection. And I'm going to warn you now, this book makes me cry. I swear I've read this book like three times and I get to certain parts and I, if you hear me pause, it's because I'm trying to compose myself. This book is titled An Ordinary Day. And before we start, I'm going to give you a head start. We're going to look at how this book was cataloged. And um, the little annotated summary in our own catalog states, an ordinary day in an ordinary neighborhood turns out to be extraordinary in this story about new life, death, and family. So over in the subject headings, we see childbirth, death, families, family life, neighborhoods. Okay, screams realistic fiction, right? So I'm going to take you out. And I've got this book in Google, and we're going to share this book together. And like I said, if I get quiet, it's because I'm starting to cry. I'm sorry. So here we go. An ordinary day. Oh, I wonder if I have to refresh it. Oops. Sorry, guys. There we go. It was an ordinary day in the neighborhood. There was Mrs. LaFleur overwatering her roses. There were Kaya and Joseph attempting to catch lizards. There was Magnificent the Crow letting everyone know that she saw what they were doing and that she did not approve. Across the street, two houses sat unusually quiet. Almost at the same time, a car pulled up to each. From one car came a woman. She had a stethoscope draped around her neck and she carried a little bag. From the other car came a man. Like the woman, he wore a stethoscope around his neck and he carried a little bag. The visitors walked to the front doors. Sorry, my chat box. Each visitor raised a hand. Each knocked quietly. After a moment, each of the doors opened. The two visitors slipped inside, and once the doors closed, the street seemed to forget about them entirely. Inside the house on the left, a family gathered around a bed. On it lay the golden retriever named Sally. Music played, soft and without too many words. Oops, sorry. Inside the house on the right, a woman rested on a bed. Music played here too, soft and without too many words. Each visitor unstrung a stethoscope. Each visitor listened to a heartbeat. Each visitor looked up and spoke the same words. She is ready. In the house on the left, the family prepared to say goodbye as the visitor filled a syringe of medicine. In the house on the right, the family prepared to say hello as the visitor rubbed circles of oil in the woman onto, into the woman's back. Outside, Magnificent the Crow continued her declarations about everything. The neighborhood children went inside for ice pops. Mrs. LaFleur turned off the spigot and wound the hose. Inside the house on the left, a final breath was exhaled. Surrounded by family and love. And on the house on the right, a first breath was inhaled. Surrounded by family and love. For once, Magnificent the Crow fell silent. A woment passed a moment in which the visitors, a moment passed, and a moment passed, a moment in which the visitors, the families, the street, and the world shifted. <clears throat> 
It wasn't an ordinary day in the neighborhood. It was an extraordinary day in the neighborhood. Like all days in all neighborhoods everywhere. Okay. All right. So let's take you to the test again. What did you see? What did you read? Does this fan book belong in the diverse family bookshelf? So in the chat, what did you see? What did you pick up in those pictures that would tell you that this book belonged in the diverse family's bookshelf? We know it has family death, which is one of the family relationships things. Okay, spot on Zoe. Okay, and Zaritza. Hey, Christine, we've got interracial and a lesbian couple. We have a multiracial, we have an interracial lesbian couple family. So I'm trying to remember if I kept the pictures here for you all. If you didn't catch it, as a matter of fact, yes, and that's exactly it. When you saw the family um, on the floor um, cuddling each other, and that is exactly it. Black family in the second house. So one of the things we do <clears throat> as we're, we're trying to find these treasures, we are also doing a picture book diversity audit in our curriculum materials center. Is that if there are certain books, sometimes I actually reach out to the authors. And the author of this book, Elena Arnold, I actually reached out to her because I wanted to ask her some questions. And I wanted to ask her about the book because I couldn't assume that the two women on the floor as they were embracing in a loving way were a lesbian couple. I did not want to assume because it's such an important part of that book. I did not want to put anything, my words, my, my intent on trying to assume what that meant. So we find ourselves more and more reaching out to confirm with these authors, what was their intent when they conveyed this? And this was her response. Dear Amy, thanks so much for reaching out. I absolutely love the composition of families in an ordinary day, but I can take very little credit for them. As an author of picture books, I make it a practice to only include essential notes to the illustrator, believing that the work is a partnership between writer and artist. And she leaves the room to decide. So it was the artist Elizabeth who gave the dog's family two moms. Yes, a lesbian couple and yes, interracial. So good job, you found him guys. But I totally missed this next sentence. She also chose to give the father in the birthing room a cochlear, a cochlear implant, another wonderful element of diversity. I absolutely love the choices that she made. So even reaching out, I find it very interesting to find from the authors what they are trying to convey and making sure that you know we get it right. I also wanna point out something to you that there is another piece to the Diverse Families Bookshelf that we've started about, it's probably going on a little over two years now. The students in the School of Teacher Education are taking it upon themselves in certain classes to have the option of writing lesson plans for the books inside the Diverse Family Bookshelf. And the really, the, one of the main focuses is that they're trying to impart are looking at aspects of empathy and social and emotional learning. And the way that you know a book has a lesson plan, so this one is Rescue and Jessica, and this was actually written by a practicum student that we had work in the Curriculum Materials Center, is that it will say view lesson plan down here. And I love to share this because this gives you a really great picture, and I just updated this yesterday. So far, we have 32 lesson plans written by students from the School of Teacher Education over the course of two years for the Diverse Family Bookshelf. Those 32 lesson plans, just those 32 lesson plans, have been downloaded 2,849 times in 81 countries. So these students, these students, our own UCF students, who, who knows, it could be one of you listening right now, or maybe you might want to partake on this and help us with the, the writing lesson plans after you visit us here. What an impact they have. They're writing a lesson plan for a course to get a grade, but look at the outward impact they've had literally across the world. 
The other thing is that once they get their lesson plan uploaded into STARS, the digital repository associated where our Diverse Families Bookshelf is actually housed, they're published authors. If you look down here um, on the screen to the left, they actually have their own URL, their own um, link that they can put on their resumes. And they can also get updates as far as how often their lesson plan has been uploaded or download, excuse me. This one, Rescue and Jessica, oh, I'm trying to remember, I looked at it yesterday, has been downloaded like over 300 times, just that one lesson plan. So the Diverse Families Bookshelf is really taking on a unique finding tool, not only for connecting readers with books that reflect who they are, but also helping educators um, reveal those aspects as far as educational tools within the books. And with that in mind, if you are a federal work study student, the Diverse Family Bookshelf, myself and Christine, who I, I do believe is with us right now, we're always looking for readers. So if you are a Florida work study, or federal work study, I keep saying Florida, uh, that should say federal work study student, I apologize. Um, we are looking for participants to, um, to partake in this with us. We are. Oh, there's Christine. Hi, hey, I'm Christine. Wondering. Say hi to everybody, Christine. Hello. So, um, oh, and oh, for email, Zoe, the easiest email, um, the CMC email, Christine. So I'll type. Yes. Um, or I can type CMC it. at ucf.edu. That gets to me. Um, that's probably the easiest one because our last names are a little involved. That is true. All right, and there is our contact information. So I'm gonna, um, I love that Christine is joining us because Christine, they know about you from earlier in the PowerPoint as like the founding mom of the whole database. So um, that's Nuri's mom. So I'm gonna open up the chat here and I, I entirely welcome you to unmute your mic, please. Um, you can even put your video on if you like, uh, if you are uh, want to, um, socialize with us in that fashion, or you can type in the chat, or you've heard everything you need to hear. And, and I hope though that you walk away and um, remember this as a finding tool if you go off in your own families, for friends, <laughs> for educators that you may meet along the way. Um, but we're very proud to be a part of this and I'm happy to be able to present this to you as part of Diversity Week this week at UCF. So any questions for, I'm going to say for Christine and I, because Christine's here and now you got both of us. I'm here. But I want to thank each of you um, for joining us and um, spending part of your Friday, Friday with us. Okay. Thank you for Have coming, Sarita. One. Thank you for coming. Does it matter that I only do federal work study for 21, 22? I don't think that should matter, Christine, right? Zoe, it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. um, if you want to talk to me, talk to us, um, and you have it, I will get you on board as fast as possible. Yeah. Things tend to take a little longer right now. It does, <laughs> but federal work study is exempt. Thank you, Maven. Big. Thank you, Carissa. Carissa. All right, and Zoe, all right, well, if there are no questions, if anybody wants to stay in chat for a moment, um, Christine and I will, will hang out. Thank you, Angela. Um, if you have any questions you want to pose to us, we'll just kind of hang out as everybody signs off. And oh, voracious reader, I'm with you, Angela. And they are molding aspects to them. Is there a requirement for how many books I have to read in the program? Zoe, um, I would tell you that my students read um, right now the two students that I have, they're reading middle school to high school books. They are reading a variety of books. And I would say they maybe read one book a week. So no, there is not a requirement for how many books you read. It's more of a matter of just read the book and fill out a survey. And that's what I requested. Yeah, so that Qualtrics survey that I was going a little bit over, Zoe, is exactly what you would enter and, and catalog what you, you found as the reader for that book. Right. And if you're interested, go ahead and email the CMC and I'll reach out to you and we'll get you set up. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right. 
Well, thank you everybody for joining us. And um, I, I, I do too, Zoe. I didn't have anything like this growing up, but you know what? I, I, I didn't realize how much in this world I was missing, to be honest with you. So we're trying to fix that. <laughs> All right. Have a great day, everybody. Have a great day. Thank you.